All right, and uh, welcome in, everybody, here once again to the Two Guys in Beer podcast studio here in uh, lovely Minnesota. I'm glad you could join us for yet another uh, broadcast. Uh, Andy Beckstrom, Sean Field, once again, back at it in the, uh, in, in the lab, as the kids say. I don't really like that phrase. <laughs> I, I feel like it's maybe overused yeah, or improperly used, maybe. <laughs> yeah, I think improperly used would be good. I don't know if this is, well, this could be a beer lab. We're uh, dissecting true. beer with our palate. Yeah, it's true. Does that even make sense? That doesn't sound like it makes sense. But I'm, I'm down. I'll follow. Well, whatever. Yeah. After a couple yeah, of years, I'm sure it'll make a lot of sense. Yeah, we'll, we'll probably come <laughs> up with a better uh, a better uh, description maybe later on. For you know, sure. After the beer, for sure, so. And you haven't noticed, everybody, our wonderful brick wall from our masonry skills, uh, our nice new logo in between us there. Mm-hmm. Let us know what you think of that. And a new addition to the uh, to the uh, program. So yeah, uh, yeah. Again, give us feedback on anything. You know, we say it pretty much every single time. But uh, you know, the old like, share, subscribe, everything like that. But uh, you know, comment, give us feedback, recommend a beer, maybe send us some beer. Beer Maybe, is good. Yeah, go ahead and send it to us. Um, but, uh, yeah, just give us an idea of something you want to be able to see, and uh, we'll uh, we'll do our best to try to be able to, you know, put it on the broadcast and, you know, be able to kind of do a little research and talk with uh, some people and uh, get some information about whatever brewery it is. So, And speaking of talking with people, mm-hmm. on this specific uh, episode here from Hot Butcher, and he got to actually interview the owner of the brewery, what, about an hour-ish or so? Yeah. You know, with a yeah. whole bunch of questions. Got, so. a, got a chance to uh, uh, reach out. You know, we generally do try to reach out, but uh, not everybody, you know, whether it be time or they probably get, you know, a lot of media requests or things like that. You know, I, I don't blame anybody for not being able to reply or anything like that. But uh, talk, uh, talk for a little while with uh, Jeremiah Zimmer earlier today. Uh, Hot Butcher for the World is the uh, beer that we're doing today. And uh, if you see the uh, two cans that we have out there, uh, one has the logo or the uh, the art label for the beer itself. But then you'll notice that the Hot Butcher for the World logo is actually on the back of the, uh, the beer. So we'll talk a little bit more about that a little bit later. Some of the uh, notes that we have from the conversation that we had with uh, uh, Jeremiah Zimmer and... Uh, First and foremost, I want to thank him for being able to take the time out to be able to chat with chat with me a little bit and uh, give me kind of some uh, background and some history and uh, just some you know fun fact type of stuff that they got going on down there. So kind of a, a cool deal um, that has something like that. So um, just so that everybody's aware, this is uh, we've had now a couple of them, but uh, it's from kind of the Chicago land area. Uh, they have a Chicago brewery store and tap room on uh, Lincoln Avenue. And uh, then they also have a a retail store as well. So they got a couple of different places you can be able to uh, be able to get that um, for, you know, wherever you're looking to be able to uh, go to their actual location. So uh, they're in a couple of different places. But, uh, you know, it's, you know, kind of a cool deal. You know, they went from something pretty small. And and again, we'll talk a little bit about that. But, uh, you know, we'll, uh, you know kind of work on that as we go through here and uh, talk about well where they're at the other one is the uh, bedford park area okay on the other one so perfect a uh, little bit different uh you know kind of uh, uh deals and uh, it kind of a fun deal to be able to um be able to go and uh you know check out what's going on there so um first and foremost you know just kind of like a little bit of some basic stuff um about them Let's see if i can get to the about page here uh so the hot butcher uh for the world you know what i'm getting ahead of myself slow down beep, beep hold beep. it on bring it back we haven't even hit the high point yet oh we gotta open it up i even forgot about that how i forget about that because that's the key to really the key to every episode it should almost be just it's right off the top such a gorgeous sound and that's this is the whole reason we do this show is just to try and drink beer like, who mm-hmm. doesn't like to drink beer so so this is a uh an ipa uh, citra el dorado and muteca i'm probably mispronouncing that wrong so i apologize i apologize uh mr zimmer for uh, uh mispronouncing that one but uh, m-o-t m-o-t-u-e-k-a um all of those hops involved with that. It's a, a six and a half percent. It is a pint, so a, a full size guy. Uh, appears to be ripe, tropical, pleasant pine and fresh citrus type of tasting notes that they uh, talk about on the can as well. You can definitely smell the pine and citrus in it when you take a smell of it. A little bit hoppy, not too bad. Mostly, I smell mostly just kind of pine and citrus when I smell it. Mm-hmm. 
when I first opened it, I got a little bit of uh, aroma of hops, but now that it's breathed a little bit, yeah, it's it's kind of mellowed out almost even, you know, aromatically, if you will. It, it does, yes. It's... That's pretty solid, though. I do like that. I like that. It's not, not real heavy hop, um, but uh, definitely a very, very solid beer. I, I like that one a lot. Yeah, it's it's crisp too mm-hmm. for an IPA. It is a crisp IPA. Yeah, uh, it drinks pretty easy. It's smooth. Mm-hmm. You know, I like to say on our lawnmower scale, um, this one I I would probably drink a couple of these in a lawnmower scale because it's light and smooth mm-hmm. uh, for an IPA and for the hop flavor. Yeah, um, <clears throat> because it's light and smooth and even crisp, it kind of drinks like a lager to an extent. Yeah, which of course is what you prefer when you're sweating. On the lawnmower, admiring your work. Yep. You want some little crisp, clean, refreshing. And I think as for an IPA, I think uh, Jeremiah hit it on the head with this for sure. Absolutely. Yeah, I think this would probably be, uh, well, I mean, I guess it depends on how much of my lawn I'm mowing. If I'm mowing what, <laughs> what I'm currently mowing or if I'm mowing what I normally mow. If I'm mowing what I normally mow, probably about a two, uh, two, two-pounder. two But uh, <laughs> for what I'm currently mowing, probably about five. <laughs> yes. We uh we hosted for those that that, that aren't aware we hosted a, a fifty wedding fiftieth wedding anniversary uh, for uh, the in laws this last weekend and congratulations you know, to them yeah absolutely congratulations out to Dean and Cordia uh, you know many many years and you know I, you know kind of live out in the country on a farm and you know spent some time trying to you know get everything kind of cleaned up and you know painted some stuff and you know you got all the family coming over so you got to make everything you know look you know better than it ever has and you know, everything yep. like that which is good spruce you know. it up yep. but uh in part of that process we also had to make you know, some additional areas for parking and some additional areas kind of cut out to try to cut back some of the uh mosquitoes and you know things like that so you know, we'd have like three riding lawnmowers out here like buzzing around all over the place so i'm probably cutting about twice as much as what i normally do at this point so <laughs> so it's good for you yeah it's a, it's 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 but, I mean, it just allows more time for things like Sweet Home. It, it sure does, and nothing beats Sweet Home. Exactly. <laughs> Not even Alabama. When you're at Wet Home. I'll say one thing. <laughs> Sweet. That's a great Leonard Skinner. I might be going yep. to that concert here on August 30th, by the oh, way, Treasure Island. Go. So think about it. Interesting, yeah. I'm going to put that one in the, uh, the files top, here. and Leonard Ooh. Skinner is the, the headliner. So. That'd be fun. Yep. Um, I'm assuming, though, that it's a, so. In talking with uh, Jeremiah, he said that the majority of uh, pretty much all their beers um, have Chicago references. So they're a Chicago brewery, okay. but they have grown to be able to distribute in a lot of different places. But uh, you know, they're a lot of the names and some of the artwork is still kind of based more locally. They want to still try to stay connected with kind of that Chicago area. Um, so I would assume, assume Sweet Home Chicago would probably be the. Uh, the song on that one but it could be yeah yep. I, I would assume i guess i didn't ask about that one particularly but uh, uh that is kind of their their plan or their kind of intention i guess with that um they they really want to try to be you know connected with that you know still local community even though they have you know grown quite a bit so um uh, one of the the big things that they wanted to talk about uh, a little bit that uh, in talking with jeremiah uh, made sure to uh mention that um in some of the releases, it's a constant churn of new and returning favorites, sometimes two beers in a week, other times six beers in a week. So they have a lot of rotation with sure. their beers, uh, but they always have different batch sizes with pretty much everything that they got going on. But as far as uh, it kind of their... So they have roughly about six new beers a week? Yep. Okay, and then they have just the... How many... Main staples, do they carry all the time? A ton. A ton. Oh, uh, yeah, okay. Yeah, okay. It's, if you go onto their website, you know, under under the, the beer labels, it's, uh, let's see, what are we, three across, one, two, three, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, 23, 24, 25, 26, 27, 28, 29, 30, 31, 32, 33, 34, 35, all the way to the bottom. Oh. And three across. So perfect. I mean, that's about 90. I mean, I don't know that they have all of them available all the time. Uh, he did say that they, 
you know, it, it's kind of a constant rotation of uh, uh, beers. Um, some of them will be kind of staples that'll kind of stick around a little bit more often. This is actually one that uh, more recently they kind of decided that they wanted to have this one stick around oh, yeah. a little bit longer. So he, you know, he thought he was like, it's probably a pretty good choice of the one right. that we picked to be able to, uh, you know, have. Uh, on here. I think that um, would be a good choice for them to keep this around a little mm-hmm. bit longer. I think a lot of people would probably enjoy this. Absolutely. And so it, it, they go through like a lot of, sometimes they'll bring back, you know, old ones and kind of like, you know, whether it be, you know, time of year or, you know, things like that, or just, you know what, we haven't done this one in a while and it's kind of fun. So let's do it again. So they uh, rotate through quite a few, but uh one of the things that they wanted to also make sure uh, to kind of say, so when you think hot butcher, you know, I guess in my mind, initially it kind of con- uh, conjures up the, um, like somebody, you know, big old cleaver and, you know, the the apron yeah. and I'm just murdering hops, that's you know what, what I mean? Yeah. Something like that. But that's not actually really what it's even about. Um, so it, it's kind of somewhat based a little bit on a uh, poem from uh, Carl Sandburg. Uh, the, the, it's actually a poem uh, called Chicago. Um, Hog butcher is what it's uh, it referred to in here. Hog butcher for the world, tool maker, stacker of wheat, prayer with railroads and the nation's freight handler, stormy, husky, brawling, city of the big shoulders. So that's kind of the idea that, that they kind of somewhat took some of the name from. But the uh, hog butcher for the world, the idea of it, uh, it isn't so much about that. It's more so about the people that actually do the butchering. If you've ever gone to like a butcher shop, you know, you're going in there. Yes, you're going into a place where they do a lot of those type of things. Yep. But you're getting people that are like passionate about their craft. And, you know, like they're friendly. They want to talk about it. They want to explain it. like they're just excited to talk about like, oh, I got this new thing here. We got some of this stuff over here. This is really good. You know what I mean? That's right, kind of, yeah. and so that's kind of what they're trying to do. Um, it's not trying to, you know, be the kind of the, the bloody attacking type of uh, story behind it, but a lot of uh, inspiration from the passionate, knowledgeable people that have done things like that. And so that's kind of, they took it from the hog butcher over to, you know, hop butcher. So that's kind of where that goes. Um, and then as far as like the for the world part, uh, what it says on their uh, website here, uh, the for the world part is an important and meaningful element of our name. It inspires the ingredients we use, the characters on our labels, the balance of our beers and how we communicate and more. It guides everything from who we partner with uh, to get our cans and kegs and where they're distributed and where they may someday be distributed. Okay. So, they're definitely kind of, you know, want to be part of the world, you know, you know, not just, you know, kind of a local thing, but they want to, it's not like they're starting global, but they want to think that like, you know what, someday potentially might be there. We don't make good decisions for all that. Sure. So does Jeremiah collaborate with any other breweries? Is he, has he in the past? Is he brew himself or does he not do that anymore? Does he have a brew master now or... Yeah, we Did didn't get too, yeah like we that? didn't get too much into okay. that a, a little bit, but uh, he was you know, obviously heavily involved you right. know initially. I'm, I'm assuming he's probably got some additional people that he's uh, brought on, uh, but he is part of that decision making process sure. with the, you know what they're making. But uh, yeah, they, they they like to do uh, collabs, and uh, the you know he said that uh, they're looking they're always looking for fun and new ways to engage with people. They really want to like. It, it's go back to the discussion of like their name, the hot butcher that, you know, that friendly, engaging, knowledgeable person, they want to try to engage with more people all the time. So they try to do collabs. They try to do uh, different work with like uh, cocktail rooms or, okay. you know, things like nice. that. So it's not just within that scale of just brewery, you know, right there, you know, they're working with restaurants, they're working with, you know, vendors to be able to do things. Um, he actually said that uh, initially, part of the reason why they started distributing, you know, oh, kind of a little bit on a wider level was mostly because they were trying to just get into more uh, festivals. They oh, wanted okay. to get the beer out there sure. in more festivals, get the beer in, you know, in more hands. And, you know, kind of like in a way, like we do on the podcast, where we always ask for feedback and want people to do, they wanted to get into the festivals to like, hey, this is what we have. We're really passionate about it. Like, are we on point here? Do you like this? Do you enjoy this? You know, like give us some feedback, you know, like we want to talk about it. And the more they did that, the more they started to grow and started to expand and, you know, just kind of somewhat sure. took off from there. Nice. So, kind of like uh, growing by word of mouth. Yeah. You know, networking, mm-hmm. old fashioned way, your boots on the ground or cans on the ground, bringing cans with you to drink, you know, kind of that kind of mm-hmm. sounds like kind of that. 
what yep. you're explaining to me. So, and they're still involved with uh, festivals and things like that. But it's uh, it's definitely something that that's kind of where it started. You know, I mean, they started obviously locally in Chicago and try to kind of grow it within that area. But that's kind of where they started to work with out of state distributors to be able to get into the festivals in other areas to just see like, all right, it is. Minnesota, an area that would like something like this. You know what I mean? Like, are, are our tastes similar? You know what I mean? Like, I, do they like that? I would say yes. I would answer that question as a yes. <laughs> so Absolutely. continue to bring your fine quality beer to Minnesota. We'll continue to drink it for you. We mm-hmm. uh, we appreciate that. Thank you very much. Absolutely. Um, so they, they initially, I mean, obviously, you want to try to grow and try to do everything that you can. But initially, it was just, all right, we're just going to start local. We're going to try to get into some of the festivals to kind of you know, meet and engage people. And because of that, it started to expand a lot more. And now they're up to uh, 30 states. Wow, and every nice. so often, they are uh, distributed into other countries as well. Um, they've worked with a, um, a distributor that... Uh, uh, Europe, uh, the European Union and the UK uh, brew export is uh, what the business okay. is. And so they work with them and it'll just randomly uh, kind of periodically send it to different countries to, to kind of taste test like, would this play well in Israel? And that so would be interesting. He, he, that's what he said. He's that's like, it's just remarkable to all of a sudden see like our little brewery from whatever. I mean, not little brewery, but, you know, like from, our little like small yeah, our little idea. to what it is now. Yeah. yeah. And, and now we're in Canada. Now we're in Israel. And now it's in the UK. And what kind of feedback you get from you know things like that, and you know the people that you know like it, and if there's a demand in in different areas, and so you know it's kind of become more about the world. But uh, you know he, he's like they started working with Brew Export, and it's been just a fantastic pairing, and it's been you know a lot of fun to see kind of where they end up and where it goes. Yeah, that that would be interesting to see what kind of feedback they're getting from consumers in other countries, you know, because. You know, other states in the United States have different palates and different types of drinking. You know, when you go to a completely different country and they have completely different food and ingredients and things mm-hmm. not even associated with what we drink here. You know, what comes to mind when you say that, you know, in Las Vegas, if you go to the Coca-Cola store, you know, when you go up to the second floor, you can actually get a flight of Coca-Cola. Of, I don't remember if it's 12 or 24. You know, correct me if I'm wrong. But all those Coca-Colas are Coca-Colas from different countries. What they market in that country is Coca-Cola. Mm-hmm. And when you go to drink some of those Coca-Colas that we would think would be Coca-Cola <laughs> is not Coca-Cola, but it's Coca-Cola right. in that country. Yeah. So it would be interesting. And there are vast differences from our Coca-Cola classic here to a mm-hmm. Coke in Spain or Israel. You know, it might taste like orange in Spain. I don't remember exactly, but they're super distinct. I wonder what the beer drinkers think about, you know, do, drinking something from Chicago or United States right. in another country. Or it's like a Coke from McDonald's, the country of McDonald's. Uh, right. Uh, <laughs> which there is actually a thing behind that. There like, a, it's I, always refrigerated. Yeah, yeah and it's, it's in metal tins. Yeah, too. that's yeah, that's one of the biggest things yeah. instead of like the, the bag, the bladder bags yeah. or whatever. Yeah, so it's, I actually kind of learned that just recently. Yeah. Today. I was like, it's I always, always thought cool. that it was different, but like that's – it's kind of interesting to yeah. be able to uh, – See what the difference is, I guess, to a certain extent. Always gold, so. and they have it in the metal containers. Mm-hmm. Yep. So uh, let's Anyways, see here. Where sorry. was I at? Now i got to get back to my notes here. <laughs> Hot butcher brewing here. <laughs> Mr. Zimmer here. Uh, so uh, they started in 2014. Uh, that's when they kind of got everything you know, off the ground as far as like the idea and you know the name and everything like that. Uh, first beer sold in early 2015, uh, and it started to really kind of catch some attention in uh, 2016. Okay, one really question. So they got it off the ground in 2014. Was it him and his wife? Was it just him? Was it a group of guys? Like, how did it? Uh, it, it he said it was kind of him with maybe a couple people, oh, but okay. we didn't get too okay. deep into uh, you know into you know that specifics sure. uh, okay. of who is all involved at that point in time. More so, just the the brewery of just, you know kind of so where they perfect. started and went. Right. Um, but it sounded like there was kind of a small group of people that was uh, involved with that uh, initial uh, setup, um, and they actually didn't even start with their own place uh they started as uh, a kind of contract brewing with uh, another location so okay. they set up uh, actually brewing at another brewery um they had their own area but they didn't have the equi- they didn't do the equipment you know, so at that time. similar to microphone when they yep. lease yeah perfect yeah gotcha. they did that cool. so awesome um initially it was a 15 barrel batch per month 
Um, that's kind of where it started. So pretty decent, you know, barrel yeah. just to be able to get going with that. Uh, but everybody that was doing this, uh, you know, all the people. So this is where he was mentioning the group that was involved. Uh, they were all doing full time jobs, and they were so they were just doing this basically on the side, just kind of forever, you know, for fun. Like we'll see where it goes, and we'll do the thing. Welcome to the Two Guys and Beer Podcast, folks. Exactly. That's <laughs> you know, it is, it is so many times that that's kind of what it is. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so they uh, they did that initially, but then they uh, kind of got a little bit bigger, and it started kind of catching on. As I mentioned, about 2016, started to really kind of ramp things up. And so then they had to move to a different brewery and contract with a different one to be able to up their batches a fair amount. Uh, bigger equipment, larger facilities. Uh, they were up to a 90-barrel batch and a 60-barrel batch per week at nice. that point. So nice. you started at a 15-barrel per month, and now you're up to, between the combination, about 150 barrels per week in different you know, batch sizes and yeah, stuff. That's some good growth there. Uh, once they get kind of to that area, uh, about 2021, uh, at the end of 2021, they uh, got their own location and moved tanks and everything into their own uh, setup. Uh, downtown has a 15-barrel system, and we'll, they'll do batches of between 7 and 30 barrels at a time. And then Bedford Park has a four-vessel 30-barrel system into 60 and 90-barrel tanks for uh, different batches. So... Definitely grew quite a bit, yeah. you know, over the course of the years, and you know, a lot of fun to be able to, uh, you know, see like how much they've been able to do that. So, um, actively growing the business, I did. I did ask him, you know, kind of the way that he, he explained it, you know, like, okay, well, you know, we're getting into some festivals, but you know, we can kind of start local, and we'll just the festivals to get you know feedback and talk to different people and just interact with people. Um, you know, he's like, it's been kind of a not slow, but. And I did, I did kind of ask, I mean, I'm sure it seems like a blink of an eye, but at the same time, you know, over the course of a handful of years, like it's almost, you know, 10 years now since they kind of hatched the idea and really started getting into it. And now it's grown to what it is now, you know, it's kind of more of an organic growth rather than just like starting with, all right, I'm going to put $5 million down and build this giant sure. thing and, you know, all the stuff. And so, you know, I asked, I'm like, do you, you know, for future plans, you know, are you thinking, you know, kind of more of the organic growth or, you know, like you really like, do you have plans or specific things? And, you know, he said like, no, they're, they're actively, you know, looking to continue growing as much as they can and trying to be involved with a bunch of different things. Um, like, like I said before, looking for fun and easy ways to engage with people, uh, participate in festivals and find new accounts in and out of Illinois, you know, whether it be restaurants or, you know, different places to have it on draft rather than just like breweries sure, or, you yeah. know, just their own little thing or just liquor stores. You know what I mean? They want to try to, you know, see if, you know, people will, you know, it'll pair well with, you know, a pork chop or a steak or, you know, something like that. I could go for a pork chop right now. I think a pork chop would sound great right now. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, so that's kind of what they're, you know, kind of working on as they go. Um, he did say uh, that, you know, the biggest, one of the biggest things for them is it's not about having a shtick. It's not, they're not trying to be kitschy or anything like that. They want to be uh, genuine and wanting to be part of the community and giving people a chance to be able to interact. And, yeah, you know, that's, it's something that we've heard many times, you know, from different breweries and kind of what their mantra is or what their background or what their thought is, is wanting to involve people and just have that sense of community, you know, working with different breweries and working with different, you know, organizations to, you know, just bring people together, you know, so a lot of fun with that. Yeah, it sounds like a great place. I mean, he took the time for us, so that's mm -hmm. really cool. Yeah, we appreciate that. Absolutely. So as I mentioned before, a lot of the beer names are uh, uh, usually Chicago historical references. Uh, so if you look on their... Um, website as i mentioned uh you just right on the main page like it goes through like a whole pile of uh, uh different you know beers that are there but a lot of them you know make references to chicago mainstays one of them is a, a personal pan pizza it's a uh, citra and vic secret hopped uh, american pale ale um let's see here they got yeah uh, let's hear all directions at once um i want the beef you know, there's uh, a, there is a triple <laughs> IPA that I really liked, a triple snorkel squad, oh, triple oh, snorkel nice. squad, okay. um, and that's a triple IPA. But you know, I mean, kind of based with the you know, Chicago Fire, you know, and that's one of the things that they also do is they have a lot of artwork. You know, if you look at their website um, at uh, hotbutcher.com, they have, as I mentioned, all of the you know labels you know kind of listed right there as far as you know what they they make or what they have. 
And the artwork is absolutely incredible. And if you click on any of them, you know, go into it and it'll talk a little bit about, you know, this is a, the secret snacks. It's a double India pale ale, uh, 8.0 ABV, what the hops are involved with that, uh, when it was last canned, and then the label artwork. So they actually highlight the artist to make sure that, you know, there's some credit, you know, given oh, that's cool. with that as yeah, well. Yeah, that's awesome. So it's kind of fun to be able to, you know, see that. And, you know, that's what they said is they want to try to make sure to give people, you know, give back you know, even on things like that, you know what I mean? They give credit where credit is due, but the artwork is just absolutely incredible for so many of these different things. And we've talked about that before with the labels that, you know, like, you know, coming up with the idea for labels and, you know, what you're going to call beers and stuff like that. And that's, theirs is to kind of give a lot of nods to historical things around Chicago and And be able to be, you know, stuck with that. You know, the artwork and that we talked about the labels and the names, you know, as a consumer, when you're in a liquor store looking for some craft beer, that's what really draws your attention right away is the name, the label first, mm-hmm. and then the name. You know, so that's really key. I think that they um, give some recognition to the artists and the labels and stuff like mm-hmm. that. Uh, uh, definitely works out great that way. I think that's really awesome that they actually do that. So, because that really is what sucks. I know when I'm in the liquor store buying a craft beer, it's the art on the can that really sucks me into. Oh, yep. let me check with that out, and then I read the name, and if it sounds cool, I'm like. Yep. Grab a case of that and let's bring it to Andy and let's go. You there know, we go. Another episode of Two Guys and Beer. Mm-hmm. And that's it. And that's it. I'm kind of the same way. I mean, there's so many beers where, like, it's, I mean, they have their own labels and they, you know, have their own thing, but it's their name forward. You know what I mean? And that they're, that's right. what's really highlighted. But it, it, what's kind of interesting with them is, you know, you look at their label, the biggest thing that shows up is the artwork and the name of the beer. But the logo for the actual brewery is not hidden, but it's on the back. You know, with the uh, the UBC code, and you know, it's not, you know, it, it's in a different spot. You know what I mean? You'd think that you know, a lot of places put it. You know, that's their thing. They want that name recognition. But he even said that you know, we want to highlight that artwork, and that's kind of the vibe that we want to have. Those we want to you know, get people like, hey, this is going to be a hot butcher type of beer because they like the artwork and things like that. They want to have that kind of cool vibe, like you're saying. Sure. Look for something that you know would be kind of fun that you want to be around and want to be involved in. Well, how about this as an idea? This is an idea for you, Jeremiah, for Hot Butcher. Maybe there's a brewery in Chicago that already has it. I don't really know. Uh, but since you're referencing Chicago, history of Chicago, what about the mob scene in Chicago? Ooh. What if Hot Butcher had a line of beer that was a, like the mob scene with some different mob characters and stuff? I don't know how that would incorporate. I don't know if any breweries have that out there, but that's the first thing I thought of right. when you, you were that is kind of talking what, to him, bringing him up historical yeah. Chicago. The first thing that came to my mind, I don't know why, <laughs> was historical <laughs> crime mob figures because they would come up to Minneapolis too, you know, mm-hmm. they'd run back and forth between the two cities. But mm-hmm. I thought that that might be a cool line of beer to have maybe as some sort of mob, hot butcher mob line or some mm-hmm. sort maybe. Yeah, I, it's, I mean, I guess it's not necessarily uh, uh, mob related, but uh you know, I mean, it, we referenced, you know, kind of being involved in the community and, you know, Chicago historical things. One of the ones that they've had recently also is uh, a, a, a nod to, um, if you're familiar with WGN or, you know, anybody that's oh, sure. broadcast on there, yep. um, uh, Tom Skilling uh, was a longtime weatherman that was there uh, after 45 years was retiring. And so they created a brew, a brew for that, the Tom Freaking Skilling beer oh cool <laughs> which apparently the uh the wgm awesome. uh morning show did kind of a little bit of a skit uh based on him or whatever and they kind of made it a little nod to that and a nod to a uh, tom skilling so oh, they thought cool. it was kind of a, a cool type of deal and um they said that it like sold out like very fast you know awesome. <laughs> so it was a <laughs> uh, cool you know, kind of a cool thing, but uh, you know it was uh, it definitely a uh, a fun deal hundreds of cases sold out within days Perfect. What, uh, what they said on there. So kind of a, a fun thing that they did, uh, kind of giving a nod to, you know, kind of a little, little bit of a local legend there. So, you know, a lot of a lot of fun stuff that they got going on, and I highly recommend, you know, checking it out. Try to find it. Uh, if you go to their website, uh, they do have a uh, location where you can do uh, find our beer, so you can be able to find out as far as, uh, you know, whether it be at uh, certain um liquor stores or certain restaurants or, you know, things like that. Uh, there's a whole segment of outside of um, Illinois. So Minnesota is listed on there, obviously, because that's where I got it. 
was in Rochester. This is at, uh, I, I believe it was Jack's Bottle Shop. I have to double check that that's what it was, but I believe that it was Jack's um, Bottle Shop down in Rochester. Um, great place to be able to go. I think I've talked about it a couple of times, and I'm going to keep talking about it because, you know what, it's good. Any and place, beer is good. Yeah, any any liquor store that uh, pushes craft beer, and that's what kind of prominently they have, that's that's the place to go, you know, mm-hmm. for sure. And that, that's just an awesome place. Yeah, so it's it's just a, a fun spot. You know, they have you know good stuff to be able to, you know, be able to pick from. They have uh, craft beer everywhere in that location, and uh, yeah, I want to thank them also for kind of putting us on. You know this uh, particular yeah. brew, so you know we I met, made sure to mention that also to Jeremiah when I was talking to him that you know that that's it was them that you know they said that they were highly impressed and wanted to. Uh, you know, highlight that one. You know, they thought it was good. Uh, Jack's Bottle Shop is what it is. So Jack's Bottle Shop in uh, Rochester is uh, what it is on uh, 6th Street Northwest. So I uh, want to thank them for kind of putting us on this and, uh, you know, just giving us that idea to be able to go there. So I'm assuming it's probably in multiple locations, but um, for sure you can find it there in Rochester. Um, I got to believe you might be able to get it, even if you request it, um, at uh, the D- the Dabbler Depot in St. Paul. I've talked about that That's place a couple of times, place, too. Yeah. So, And Total Wine is another good place, too. I know it's mm. called Total Wine, but if you walk into there, they have every craft beer you can imagine by style, by country, by this, by that. There's uh, one store I've seen. Like the old old fashioned libraries, when you get on the ladder that's on the track and it slides down, and you actually go up and there's beer <laughs> that high up, and they get and pull it down. So, uh, I wouldn't be surprised to find uh, some hot butcher there at, at, at Total Wine and Spirits. And there's I think two locations in Minnesota. So, yeah, it's definitely likely that it would uh, um, probably be at that. So, but uh, yeah, I want to thank Jeremiah Zimmer for uh, being able to take the time and uh, you know spending a little bit of a, a you know chance to be able to chat about things a little bit and give us some uh, information and some you know background of it and you know it's whatever's there now is you know, go back again next week you'll be able to find you know between two and six different types of beers that are just there so they have you know quite the rotation that they got and they got they uh, are trying to rotate through and be able to uh, sling out the door if you will sure. so. But uh, Sweet Home is what we have for the uh, particular episode today. Uh, Sweet Home by Hot Butcher over there in Illinois. Uh, Thanks, Jeremiah. I appreciate your time. Even though I didn't get a chance to chat with you, but we appreciate your time helping out our podcast here. Uh, Go get yourself some Sweet Home. It's good beer. Absolutely. So... That's uh that's kind of the long and the short there of uh, a Hot Butcher for the world. Um, What else you got? I think you were saying something about uh, you had some Chicago content. Yeah, kind of. It just, uh, I thought we better talk about this since the whole sports world is talking about this. You know, now that we're getting on to our, our bar banter part of the episode here, <laughs> where after you have a beer, you just banter about whatever. Uh, but I kind of want to talk about uh, the WNBA a little bit here, mm-hmm. which is kind of crazy that we want to talk about it. Been around a long time. Doesn't typically generate a ton of excitement, even though they are skilled players. Uh, very mm-hmm. fundamentally sound, very fundamentally skilled. I've attended a few games. I got went to Game 7 of the Minnesota Lynx, Los oh, wow. Angeles Sparks uh, finals, which we lost. Mm. Uh, that particular championship. Um, Dang, Sparks. So I just kind of want to bring it up a little bit because, you know, you got Angel Reese, you know, that rookie over there and plays for the Chicago Sky. She's um, not afraid to say the words. <laughs> she's not afraid to say anything. Um, and, of course, you know, the, the big Caitlin Kirk. How she's turned into some controversial figure, mm-hmm. it's just mind-baffling. I kind of wanted your take on it here. I, I think she's been a great ambassador for the WNBA. Like She's brought more excitement to the mm-hmm. WNBA than probably anybody in the history of the WNBA. Any games she's playing, I was just looking at the attendance records, 18, 20,000. Any well, game she's not in, five, 6,000. And she is taking so much heat on all of social media on how the WNBA is racist in some way and um they're catering to her because she's white or this or they're playing her on national tv well she's super skilled Mm -hmm. you know look if you look at her stats like on on social media i just saw the other day like the top 10 rookies this year she's like number eight that's not even possible she's literally out statting everybody in every category up to number one like i don't know what's going on like what the big deal is like let's get 
more notoriety to the mm. WNBA so they can showcase their skills. Like that's what what they need. Yeah, you know. Yeah, and I think that that's you know. I mean, if you're asking my opinion, I think that that's one of the things that you know. I, I and I've heard some of that stuff too. And you know, you, you could go ahead and make a case for you know whatever kind of idea you want to get at, but the WNBA has done a really good job trying to market everybody. Well, multiple so. multiple different players over the course of the years, whether it be Lisa Leslie back in the day. Um, uh, now I can't remember her name. Cheryl um, Swoops. Yeah, Cheryl Swoops Tamika for a long Katrins. time. Yeah. Um, uh, you know, of course, even Maya, Maya Moore, Moore right? Simone Augustus, mm-hmm. you know, Katie Smith. You know, of course, now I'm naming off Lynx players, you know. Right. Sue yeah. Bird. And know, I'm trying to think huge. of uh, the – the. there's the one that uh, – I think she just retired, but, uh, like, she's been even on the TNT broadcast for right. NBA stuff. Uh, uh, Candace Parker. Candace Parker. In- incredibly talented, like – and it's going to be weird to say photogenic and has a like a good personality for that type of thing. Sure. And so that's something that you can you know kind of latch to and be able to try to expand within. And what Caitlin Clark is doing is basically the exact same thing. I don't think that she's necessarily asking for any of this. It's I just, don't think so either. That's just what's happening. And it, it kind of was coming along at the right time for just, I guess, women's sports in general. I've seen an explosion of following, especially with the NCAA tournament with the last couple of years in the NCAA women's tournament, I, I went out of my way to go and find a bar or go find a place to be able to watch, watch it. Yeah, uh. I sought it out. I've never really done that before on that side, and I did it more for that than the men's tournament this year. By far. You get somebody that you can kind of attach to that, you know, for whatever reason that anybody has, you know, that whether they're just a good ambassador or they're just an incredible talent. When you see somebody that's just like a, a generational talent at something, you look at people like a Steph Curry, I guess, with basketball, Michael Jordan. Um, you look at like a Tiger Woods when he was at the top of his game. You know, golf right now, I mean, they do have Scotty Scheffler, but they don't have somebody. Scheffler might turn into that, but they don't have somebody that's that generational talent that people are like seeking out watching golf right now. Right. And that's at Tiger, they were because you have somebody like that. And that's Caitlin Clark right now. It, and I like, think that she there's... was by far the best college basketball mm-hmm. player oh my in God, the country yeah. yep. last year. Yeah. And Angel Reese was not far behind. Mm-hmm. You know, they had a great rivalry. I to me I oh, likened absolutely. it. I likened their rivalry because Angel Reese won it the previous year. You know, mm-hmm. Caitlin Clark, they didn't win the title. Heck, I don't even remember. That's terrible of me. Yeah, they, 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 won, they didn't they win lost. The, yeah, they didn't win the title, but, but they, they beat, beat Angel Reese. Yeah, in the uh, in the final there. four. Yep. What I like in the Angel Reese Caitlin Clark competition or competitiveness between the two. I think it's great. I think it's good for mm-hmm. women's basketball. 100%. I, I love that Angel Reese talks. I love they're, they're both outstanding players. It kind of reminds me of the Magic Johnson, Larry, Larry Bird, Bird. Yep. yep, of the NBA in the mm-hmm. 80s, early 90s. Like That's yep. exactly what the WNBA needs is Angel Reese and Kaitlyn Clark to shine that spotlight yep. on that sport and, and mm-hmm. get it going. Absolutely. And I think that that's you know, why people are going after her. I just don't understand. I mean, I think that part of that is just it's the nature of the beast when you become that popular and that big. And you're a is, rookie and you haven't barely yeah, played any it, minutes in the WNBA. You know, those WNBA players are pretty sound. Like, Oh, absolutely. They're awesome. Mm-hmm. You know, they're they're no joke. I mean, it, look at look at uh, Kaylin Cart got left off the USA Olympic mm-hmm. team. That doesn't bother me. Kaylin Clark is an extremely good basketball player. Mm-hmm. But those people that are on gals that are on the WNBA Olympic team are super good. That team is super deep. Yep. If Caitlin Clark got selected to play, she'd be lucky to play a couple minutes a yep. game. It wouldn't be too dissimilar from the Dream Team in ninety ninety one. Yeah. When Christian, when Christian was Lainer. on there. Yep. One of the best college basketball players of all time. But he barely got off the bench. Have, yeah. Wouldn't you have know, been it's, it's the same thing. So the fact that she didn't get selected doesn't bother me one, but mm-hmm. she'll be on there for years to come, yep. you know. And I think that I think potentially they I could have seen them selecting her, but like you said, I don't know that she would have played a ton. But I think that that would have been kind of more of a I don't want to say a media selection, but it would have been a get eyeballs on it type of selection. Right. But knowing that she wouldn't play that much, they probably don't want to have that negative 
type of vibe to it. You know what sure. I mean? Because people would tune in to watch her, and if she doesn't play, then they'd be mad about it. You know. But so, I, 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 but I do that, completely that agree true. that like she's she's going to be a phenomenal talent. She's going to be amazing. But as a rookie, you can even tell like right now she's starting to break through it a little bit. But she's learning to play at that next level. Right. It doesn't matter who you are when you take that next step. It's, Michael Jordan, he had his flash moments, but he also kind of struggled as a rookie. Everybody does. That's just part of that growing process. You're still kind of young, kind of immature. You're not as refined as them. You were just the best at your position with a lot of people that were really good. And now you're going to be jumping into a pool where everybody's amazing. Super good, yeah. Now, can you imagine Angel Reese and Caitlin Clark on the same basketball team in the next Olympics? It'd be fun. Good luck to the rest right. of the world. Like you, <laughs> for women's basketball, you ain't doing nothing. I'm sorry, yep. you're just not doing anything. Mm-hmm. And then you throw in, I don't even know the name now. That rookie the Lynx have is playing really well. I can't think of her name right now. I'm well, I know sorry. Nafisha Collier, but uh, there, she, was, there, was, there was there's there's yeah there's a different. Yeah. Uh, um, oh. I think she's native, isn't she? Uh, let's I thought see she was here. like our center or power forward. Heck, I don't remember. I'm terrible. I should remember, I should know better than that. Uh, did you know that uh, Katie Smith is an associate head coach? I did not know that. For the Lynx? Yeah. Really? Didn't know that. Looks like i got to brush up more on my Lynx trivia. There, there. you go. Uh, I'm trying to bring up the old roster here. Internet's a little bit slow when I'm oh, running okay. off of my phone. <laughs> Forgot to change it back over <laughs> before sure. we started. But uh, I... I guess to a certain extent, like even beyond anything like that, as far as what you're saying about, you know, the development and things like that, she's the type of player that like she's going to bring what she's going to bring to the table. I like the fact that she doesn't really have a whine about things kind of attitude and she's not shying away from anything at all. Not at all. But at the same time, to your point, your exact point, you nailed it right on the head. There are teams that, you know, typically don't play at an NBA stadium. They just don't. That's just their – that's what they're doing. You look at even like the PWHL. Not everybody who's playing at an XL Energy Center. They're playing at college campuses, right. things like that. Because if you only have 4,000 people showing up in a 20,000-seat arena, it seems completely dead. But if you put 4,000 people in a 5,000-seat arena, then it's packed and it's boisterous and it's fun and it's cool and you want to get more people to go. You can grow from there, and that's how you basically develop things like that. Right now, with Caitlin Clark, everywhere that she is, they're having to move the games to the NBA arenas or college arenas that are of a larger size because that's how many tickets they're able to sell at even a higher price. And that's allowing the NBA or the WNBA to be able to, you know, do flights and all sorts of different things. Yeah. You know what I mean? They they would always just do like commercial flying or you know their own flying or flying just like us. Right. Yeah. Now they're doing. But now they're chartering flights. For flights. The teams. Yeah. Yeah. And then that's, that's such a huge thing to be able to do when you have the ability to you know have something like that, and that's stuff that she's bringing to the table that some people just are not wrapping their head around or they're not I don't know if I want to say not respecting but it's they're just not allowing that to be a thing it's it's kind of crazy you know that they're not doing that but at the same time you know it I don't know you, you got to kind of let let her be her but you notice also that all of this stuff is happening you don't see her out there like complaining about this or whatever no. you'll see everybody talking about like oh my god they should have done this or people are like taking shots against her and you know trying to knock her down and like it being too aggressive and at least i haven't noticed it maybe yeah, i'm not I paying enough attention if but if it's too aggressive there was a couple of plays that were of course were all over social media and espn you know of her getting body checked a couple of times and yeah it bothered me a little bit but then i got thinking you know that reminds me of 80s basketball mm-hmm. You got a, some hot shot rookie coming in, and those veterans. Uh, We're gonna, yeah, gonna on, knock you down. They're a gonna peg. knock you around a few times. Yep. So that that's just kind of a growing process, a learning curve. You have to earn the respect. You sure do. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And that's something that I think that, that she's kind of taking that on head on, and just from a standpoint of what has she done for the game and things like that, we're talking about it. Here on a beer podcast, podcast, (laughs) we're talking about her and the situations and everything like that. Like, 
don't get me wrong. I love the links. I, and, you know, I mean, I don't, I will honestly admit that I don't follow them probably as much as I probably could. I do look at the box scores every so often. I know, you know, a couple of players that are on the team. I know that they've kind of struggled the last couple of years, but they're one of the best teams in the WNBA this year, for sure, between Nafisha Collier and Kayla McBride. Their is defense the other one. is on point this year. Holy it has cow. Been stellar. Good luck to the rest of the WNBA, man. Absolutely. Ooh. And so it's been a lot of fun to be able to, you know, kind of do that. But at the same time, like, Last year at this time, I don't think. I mean, I don't think we were recording at that point. But um, <laughs> no, we I, I, we're not having conversations <laughs> about. All right, so the WNBA playoffs right. are coming up this week. You know, like we're not doing anything like that. It, it's just it's bringing that notoriety, and everybody's talking about it. And if everybody's talking about it, advertisers are like, "Wait, hold on, they're talking about that. They're talking about the thing. We should hitch our ride to some of this stuff." Right. In the endorsements she's, and she's that's received. What, yeah, and that's what builds everything for you. You know, just it, everything, the more people are talking about something, the more, don't want to make it seem like everything comes back, comes back to money, but the more that happens, the more money you can get in the stadium, and then you can improve some of the things that, like, they want to be able to, like the chartered flights, even just something right. minor like that. You can start to change the conversation about, all right, your contract's not going to be $60,000. Right. Maybe so we can start, start to try to work contracts up a little, up bit, a little yeah. bit. Exactly. And that's some I'm glad that you brought it up and you compared it to uh Bird and Magic in the eighties because it really is a lot like that. And that was at a time when the WNBA or the actual NBA, not WNBA, the NBA, was uh kind of struggling. It they was in a struggling. Tough part. It was kind of on a downhill slope yeah, there. It yeah. was not in a good spot. No. And then that all of a sudden like attached things. People were like I want to see this. Like we got Showtime, and we got this, you know, white guy from Indiana that's doing all sorts of crazy. You know what I mean? It just became a whole different level of interest that pushed things up. And you look at where the NBA is now; they kind of stood on those shoulders to be able to get there. They you know, it obviously yeah. helped to get some, you know, hot shot young rookie from North Carolina that definitely helped. But he took some shots when he was a rookie too. You yeah, know, he wasn't. I mean, he was a good basketball player initially in the NBA, but didn't really do anything. You know, it didn't take till the late '80s, early '90s when he started having success in the NBA mm-hmm. as a team. So individually, of course, he was rocking right off the bat, but it didn't translate to team success. So, yeah, but it brought more eyes on the sport, and more eyes are going to be better. It doesn't matter. Yeah. You know, it's you're talking about one way or the other. Even if it's, I guess, to a certain extent, negative, it, as long as it's not, not too negative for too long. <laughs> you know, right. like any attention is better than no attention, and so. I don't know. I think that it's amazing, and I think that she, you know, probably isn't getting as much respect as she probably should be. But at the same time, I know where people. I understand where people are coming from. Not that it's okay, because it's not. But I get it. Like, what has she done? She's proven nothing, and you know, the the fever are terrible. Yeah, they are terrible. But they were They're terrible awful. before. Yeah. That's why they had the number one pick. It's not like they did the number one pick and then drafted about seven other people right. to just completely change their team. It's going to be kind of a multi-year process with them, but at the same time, there's a chance that in the next off season or two, you're going to see a couple of people be like, "Maybe we should go play could, for Indiana." She might, yeah. she might be onto something. I mean, you see that all over the place. You've seen that with uh, Sue Bird out in Seattle. You've seen it, um, you know, with Candace Parker. You know, whether she was moving around or whether people were kind of you know going there. You've seen it with other players, you know, not that it's quite as much of the contract jumping and teep hopping like in the NBA for it's still kind of is happening a little bit. But at the same time, there's some interest, you know what I mean? Some people may be like, I'm going to knock her down. I'm going to make sure she earns it. But at the same time, I wouldn't mind being on the wing. Over right. there, just sitting in a spot. You know how much I could probably yep. pocket a few extra dollars if I'm on a team that uh, is on national television 40 times a year and uh, playing to 20,000 people. Like I'm, I think I could probably make that work for my life. You know what I mean? You're going to see some of that in a couple of years. You know that team's probably going to look completely different. And probably be a really dang good team, yeah, mostly they, they just because be. her and what she, the attention that she brings. Yeah, yeah, I agree with that uh, completely. And and to to more of what she's done, she's played really well so far in the WNBA. You know, she didn't get any rest. She just played forty some college NCAA games in college. Yeah, and played in a national title game. What two weeks off, and now she's playing in professional women's basketball in the WNBA. So. 
That rookie year is just brutal for Ooh, the WNBA. Yeah, it's, it's and then tough. to come into like people trying to knock you down, you're already like your legs are rubber to begin with. Right. You know? <laughs> not that we know anything about that. No, no, not at all. <laughs> but yeah. No, I just wanted your take on it. It seems like some of the attention's have been kind of negative and I, I can't really figure out why. I mean, I get maybe some jealousy factor there. You know, I've heard like some race thing there. Oh, she's white, so they're going to push her. I sure hope that's not the case. Yeah. You know, I love to see a rivalry between Angel Reese and Caitlin Clark, you know, Larry mm-hmm. Bird, yeah. Magic Johnson. So I hope it's there. Um, yeah, I think that the NBA is going in the right direction for sure with those, yeah. those two gals. So. I, I, I absolutely agree. You know, and it's, you know, it's, it's just going to build over time. And I think that that's a great thing for the sport. You know what I mean? I think that that's fantastic, and I think that it'll uh, definitely be a positive thing for what they got going on. So, but uh, yeah, it's I don't know. It's amazing, you know. Like, it, and it's even from that standpoint, you had mentioned that it's kind of like some jealousy. I think that there's a little bit about it, and I think that there's almost a a little bit of I'm trying to think of the word for it, but um, it's more of a well, but we've been here and we've done it yeah for we've years. been here yeah, yeah this is we built this. this is yeah this isn't new like just she's just showing up now coming and, in yeah you know why is everybody like latching to her when we've had some superstars right over here that have been absolutely incredible and are just as good you yeah know, like like come on maya moore mm-hmm. kelsey i don't know why kelsey plum isn't a bigger thing oh, sure you know yeah. what i mean and they had the um now I'm failing to remember the name, and it's going to drive me nuts. But the, they just had the in the NBA All Star Game. They had the three point shooting contest. Um, they had the contest, but then they had like the special one, um, right? Steph Curry and yeah, they didn't they have a WNBA player teammates? Didn't they do teammates? Yeah, no, it was just the two of them. Oh, okay, okay, got it. Yeah. Um, what was her name? Now it's going to drive me nuts. She's in a um a commercial right now too. Uh, yeah, I just don't here. remember. I remember that story, but I don't remember. Sabrina the Ionescu. Oh, okay, perfect. Ionescu, Ionescu. I probably got it wrong either way. But yeah, uh, Stephen Stephen Curry and Sabrina Ionescu uh, did it kind of a, a their own little battle, and I would assume that Kaylin Clark will probably be involved in that point in time since she's kind of like Stephen Curry she's shooting from the logo. Like you know, it, I'm sure she'll probably be involved with that same thing. But you know, that's a it, it's a cool thing to be able to see some of that crossover. But that's where some of that is. We've had Sabrina. Now for a couple of years was one of the best college players of all time before Caitlin Clark came along, obviously, right. and really kind of set a different tone. And now is in the WNBA, and why haven't people latched onto her? Where was the promotion? Where was yeah. the advertising? Where was the marketing? You know, yeah, sure, yeah. And it, you know, it kind of is what it is. It, I, I, I believe Sabrina Ionescu went like Oregon or something, and so I don't know if it's a Pac-12 issue, you know, or Pac-2 issue, whatever it is now, <laughs> but, like, kind of that West Coast issue, you know what I mean, just because of, like, media markets and things like that. Well, Not that Kate and Clark is so much more East, Iowa. but, yeah, it's it's like, kind of still a small deal, but it's, I don't know, I, I wish I had a better idea of why it was, but it's just, you get that right person at that right time that you can really kind of latch on to, and when everybody does... Or when enough people do, then everybody does. And, you know, it's not to take anything away from somebody like, you know, Ionescu or Candace Parker or, you know, Maya Moore. You name your WNBA superstar. But it's, you just have to ride that as much as you can. You know what right. I mean? Be thankful that it's somebody. You know what I mean? Yeah, it may not be you, and that sucks, and I'm sorry for whatever it is, and maybe you should have been treated better or glorified more or whatever you want to say. But... It's there for somebody, and it's going to improve the state of everything for your entire league. So have fun with it. But, yes, I I do completely agree. I think a little spat between the two of them, which I don't even know that it necessarily exists because they both kind of downplayed it after the uh, championship game. But at the same time, like having a little bit of sass going back and forth, yeah, fire it up a little bit, ladies. Come on, let's go. Yeah, it, it's. I think it's. I think it's good for everything. You know what I mean? You get those clips out on you know TikTok and yeah. you know the the all the different social media platforms, and you know people talk about it. And again, more people talking about it is always a good thing. You could almost liken this to NASCAR um, from the seventies, early eighties, if I remember. I'm a NASCAR fan. I know. I know. We can talk about that all the time. But uh, in the late seventies, early eighties, now I don't remember the driver. It was one of the first televised races, one of the drivers took a swing and punched another driver. 
well, what did that do for NASCAR? Just immediately whoosh, mm-hmm. ramped it up because oh, now there's people punching each other, you know. So right, that could be like you're saying with the WNBA. Let's get it going with a little little rivalry between the two and amp it up a little bit. Yeah, yeah. I don't, don't punch I each other. Yeah, but, don't yeah you know. don't punch each other. But uh, it was <laughs> kind of fun to watch them, kind of like you know taunt back and forth just a little bit, a little bit you know, yeah, about what fun. they're doing, and you know it. A little friendly rivalry is not bad for anything. No, you know no, what I mean? It's if it's more competitive, it's always going to be better. I agree 100%. So, but, yeah. And if Caitlin Clark, if you want to come on the podcast sometime, you know, yeah. Angel Reese, if you want to be on here too, that'd be cool too. Right. Yeah, we're, 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 we're open. The schedule's open for you guys. Exactly. We'll I don't know if you guys on. drink beer or not, but, <laughs> uh, you know, potentially maybe bring some, you know, beer from the local area where you're at or something. Sure. I don't know. Or we, we get you some hot butcher sweet home. There we go. Home. Yeah, featured right in Chicago. Well, I want to uh, make sure to thank uh, once again Jeremiah Zimmer from Hot Butcher for the World uh, for taking time out of his schedule. Uh, he's got a lot going on, so I, I'm sure it, you know. Like we emailed back a couple of times trying to be able to find time, and you know, I appreciate him making the time to be able to uh, you know be a part of uh, the broadcast and be able to help kind of give us some insight into what they got going on there. I can't say enough about that. It was very kind of him to be able to do that, but. Uh, yeah, thanks for Sean uh, being here once again and uh, you know celebrating the classic uh, beer podcast. There you go. <laughs> Cheers. <laughs>